working on really creative solutions to these complex issues. And most of us, I think, would be overwhelmed and probably just give up at some point. But you guys really keep things going. So what is it that inspires you to invest the time and resources into developing some of these technologies and solutions? And Dave, we're going to start with you on that. Thank you. Yes, the ocean is a very complex environment, obviously. And to understand everything that happens in the ocean, you really need to have several tools in your toolbox. And so there, there is no answer at the back of the book for solving problems in the ocean. And so as an engineer, I focus on uh, identifying numerical modeling techniques to represent the dynamics of these structures in the ocean. I also work on doing tank tests here at the Naval Academy. We have really great facilities with respect to towing tanks and wave makers, but also I work extensively on the instrumentation. And it's really using as, finding as many pieces of the puzzle as you can to pick a, paint a picture of what's happening in the ocean. And it's a really creative process. And it's, and it's really a never ending process. That's great. So you're, you're blending the creativity with the science. And being an engineer, and there's not a whole lot of ocean engineers working in this space, I get to interact with biologists, ecologists, economists, and so I'm always learning. Around every corner, there's something that I don't know, and that's what really keeps me going. Great. And, and Tyler, how about you? What is it that, in, that motivates you, that inspires you to work in this field of technology and innovation? Uh, there's two things. The first one is to expand upon what David said. It's just really interesting. And I enjoy going to work every day. And like David said, I work with people in different disciplines. And it's all about integrating these problems that all these different areas have such as we can make the biology work, but does the financial side work? Um, all these different problems are coming together and they need integrated solutions. So it's really just interesting problems to think about and it's really stimulating. And, uh, and I think that extends to almost everybody I work with, including our clients who might come from all sorts of different fields and have no exposure to aquaculture or even marine biology and they come to us and they just say, I've heard about aquaculture and it's just so cool and I want to get involved. And so we're, we're kind of lucky to be able to work in a field that offers such new and dynamic problems that we get to think about and solve every day. And it really sort of creates a passion that's, I, I haven't worked in other industries, but I would say sort of unique to, to aquaculture. The other element, um, Innovacy works very closely with a lot of our clients. Uh, we have two research and development sites that are our commercial farms. Uh, and I've been privileged to have worked at both those farms for about a year each. Uh, so when we interact with them on a regular basis and we have a relationship with them, they give us a very personal impression of the problems that they have, which are ultimately business problems that need a solution, an engineering solution um, or feed solutions, whatever it is. Uh, but because we work closely with them and we talk to them regularly, like I said, I've, I've been there and done that work. And so it sort of resonates on both that personal level and the business level to keep you engaged. Because we're motivated both to, to develop good products and all of that, but also to help the people who are there doing that work to make their jobs easier, to make the companies more successful. And that can be really motivating. Right, so it sounds like from what both of you are saying, in addition to you know working to solve those problems and leveraging the science and the engineering, you're also building relationships, which is a, a core piece of this process. Absolutely, and you can see that when you go to the aquaculture conferences, if and when those start up again, uh, it's a close knit community. People are very friendly. Um, it's all smiles. People break down from their sort of workplace demeanor very quickly and it's hugs, it's high fives, it's jokes, um, and it's really a special industry to work in. Great, and, and Chris, how about you? What is, what is it that motivates you, that inspires you to work in this field? Well, in the face of climate change and global weirding, um, we're taking uh, industrial emissions, like the CO2 from the cement plant, and we're turning that into an aquaculture feed ingredient. 
And so we're building the carbon economy of the future. And so I'm motivated to do that, right? We don't, we, we can only sequester so much carbon. Really what I see as the future is utilizing carbon, turning it into useful things. And we're building the infrastructure and the technology to do that on a global scale. And if we're able to do that successfully at scale, we'll be saving or at least offsetting the use of billions of fish every year. So as a marine biologist, I get to save fish by doing the business of biology. And so it's really applying the scientific method to, uh, to business and you know, distributing technology on a global scale. I think the ecosystem that Tyler mentions um, about the community. I mean, everyone's working together to create this business ecosystem that works and works sustainably. And so I'm just thrilled to be a part of that. And I get to talk about fish, you know, most days. So that makes me happy. <laughs> Yay, fish. Um, and that's, that's what I love about this group, right? Fish nerds unite. Woo I want to bring up the social side of it because a part of the engineering process for these type of systems includes the social character of the people in the place. And that, in addition to the economics and the biology and the ocean engineering, that needs to be a big part of it. And that is directly related to the emotions that we feel when we see these wonderful animals being caught in this gear. And so that is a big part of what drives us. Jump in for a moment just on the, on the social side. I think that's something that's often missed about aquaculture. And that the, the social impact, it, well, for conservation, it's easy to say you can't do something. But I think if aquaculture is done right, we're, we're trying to figure out how you can do it and do it well. And what that's doing is instead of saying, no, you can't go fishing, commercial fishermen, because we put quotas on you, uh, we're saying, yes, you can farm and you can do it sustainably and you can provide uh, a livelihood for yourself and your family and you can put food on the table, sustainable food on the table for you know, thousands, millions, billions of people um, in a way that helps everybody. And I think we missed that um, in, the, in this sort of discussion around aquaculture um, and, and its impact on, on communities is that these are jobs, right? These are, you know, we're, we're saying you can't fish as much anymore because you know, fish populations are, are plummeting, um, but we want to figure out ways to farm, right? This, this happened on land, you know, thousands of years ago. Right, and, and, and it's that, that social component of um, I, I just want to make sure that I'm capturing this right. So, so understanding those interactions, not just those direct interactions between the farms and the environment, but then also with the communities and those social interactions um, and understanding the priorities and the, the needs of the surrounding communities and the people impacted, including the farmers and fishermen themselves who are relying on these for their, these opportunities for their livelihoods. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd like to add to that because Chris brings up another great point and it's a part of the design process that is not necessarily taught in engineering school. And that is design criteria. I mean, design criteria from an ocean engineering standpoint is like design for waves and currents, forces on the structure. But there's a social aspect of design that needs to go into these systems. But then there's the ecological aspect of the of design that goes into these systems. Can we design these aquaculture systems not to minimize impact, but can we do it to enhance the environment? And this is where we need to work with biologists and ecologists to design these things where maybe we can actually help a fisheries out. Is that possible? Can the science lead us in that direction? And so it, I, that's how I view it. And I think we can make major impacts if we view it from that perspective. So we really need to invest in not just looking at the potential risks and impacts, negative impacts, but also looking at the potential benefits and positive impacts that these industries can have both on the environment and society. Yeah, yes. Well, well said, Dave. I think looking at an aquaculture facility, I'd love to hear your, your perspective, Tyler, but looking at an aquaculture facility as a farm in the ocean that is polluting is one, one way to look at it. Um, it's, a, it's also a food production system. But uh, in my work in Southern California with Dr. Dan Pondello looked at what's the value of, a, of an aquaculture net cage as a fish aggregating device. 
right? What's the value to the nearshore fish assemblage? Is there value? And it looks like there very well could be if it's a sustainably operated system, right? And then if you start thinking about the other design tools like artificial reefs and enforcement tools like marine protected areas, you could have this very you know, interesting system where it's a protected area, you're producing food and you've designed it and are operating it in a sustainable way to really put inputs back into the environment that don't exceed the carrying capacity of that environment. Chris, you're spot on and it's something that's getting a lot of attention. Uh, we do a lot of depositional modeling and carrying capacity modeling and, and it's exactly like what you guys are describing. And of course it's an area that's still developing, but the design can, can accommodate both the uh, ecosystem interest and the um, economic interest of the farm. So if we know the effluent load of a particular farm, the number of pens, the stocking density, the digestibility of the feed, all of those are inputs and we can predict both the effluents that will settle on the benthic environment, that is to say the, the seafloor, as well as the dissolved inorganic nutrients. Um, these are nutrients, not waste products and they are beneficial to the environment. And we can document this because we have, when formerly, maybe 10 years ago, we didn't have this, but we have these long-term examples where people have looked at the biodiversity um, as a function of proximity to the pen or years since operation. We now just recently have the data to do studies like that. And there, there are of course examples that people will point to where it was not managed properly. And, and that's you know, um, a negative point on the industry, but it is important data that we can look at to say, this is how it shouldn't be done. This creates problems. And now we have examples of how it's been done successfully, where we observe what I would say are healthier ecosystems or ecosystems that provide more uh, ecosystem services to the users there. And we can say, if we, we keep the densities to this level, this will get a profit of X for the farm and also increase potentially fisheries revenue in this area. And it's hard to sort of get that to the level of resolution where we can put hard dollar values on it, but we can definitely document the increase in species richness, uh, species abundant, and those are of course valuable things. So it's not a matter of healthy environment and ecosystems or profit. It's a matter of healthy environment and ecosystems and profit if we go about it the right way, which is, as all of you have mentioned, is this process of understanding these interactions, understanding how they work, and then where you guys come in then is developing those solutions so that we can have that healthy environment and profit scenario. Exactly. And we're doing it. It's happening. It just takes time. And so often the debate feels like, should we do aquaculture? Should we not do aquaculture? And that's such a, an oversimplification. The question is, how can we do it to maximize the benefit to all these different users? And it takes time to build that knowledge, but we're doing it. I think something that's often lost about science is that it's really the scientific method is about trying something documenting it and learning from it and then changing it, right? And that's the opportunity here is we're not going to deploy and get it right the, the first time. This is, there's a huge effort by the entire industry to try to learn and improve and make it more sustainable over time. Um, and it's not just science says it's good or science says it's bad. It's where are we now? What do we see? And how can we imp improve it? Right, right. It's a process. Thank you.